Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to an interesting video today. Touching on a few things today. Touching on multiple things today. But Jay, I ask you this, in a world that is just so topsy-turvy, that up is down and down is up, or is up up, or is down down, we don't know. You've got NDP leaders slamming government opposition on a daily basis and they're supporting that same government. Well, they're the same government. You've got stocks and bonds, which usually work in opposite ways, going both going down last year in the market. You've got Velma series of Scooby-Doo coming out with no Scooby-Doo, like this is a world full of chaos, which you and I are just trying to navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. What is the shining light, our North store, store, our North Star, if you will? Let me tell you, Jay, it is real estate. Our guiding principle, what we can be faithful in, is real estate, ye old trusted as my ancestors used to say, and yours, because without them, you wouldn't be here. Ye old trusted real estate. And I know I'm going against the grain because a lot of people right now, especially these keyboard warriors on Twitter, no, oh, real estate's the worst. Bill Ferguson, oh, it's doing this. Metro Don't River Housing it, Clap, it's gonna be the worst. That's why you've got to look at real estate long-term. It is hard to beat real estate long-term, and there's easy ways to depict why real estate is the shiz, as your kids probably say now. Long term. How's that for an intro, That'll Jay? Intro of all time. Mike, drop. That was the most rambling on of intros we've yet had. Ph um, philosophical intro, <sighs> I might say. I don't think so. So, as you just heard the dribble about, we are touching on a variety of different topics in these crazy times. Mm -hmm. So, this morning, as you all know, if any of you follow any realtors, they have posted on their stories. The Bank of Canada has increased the rate 0.25%, 0.25. bringing us to 0 0.50. Um, you can now, but I have heard also that a lot of the banks, the actual banks, um, are uh, dropping fixed rates. You can now get fixed for 4.69. That's uh, cheap compared to the last couple of months. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, something else I read, Bank of Canada's forecast for inflation is 3% this year. Let's mm -hmm. not forget it's at, I think, 6.3 right now. 3% mm -hmm. uh, this year, and they're targeted to by 2024. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot, I think their expectations of a, of a more normalized inflation rate, and we should never normalize inflation, mm -hmm. the uh, hidden theft from the ones above, if you will. But anyway, a more normalized inflation by 2024 is a lot more um, positive talk than we've seen, uh, or at least a lot more pinpointed. 3% this year, 2% next year. Um, so do they know something we don't, as usual? They know nothing. Um, I obviously tend to agree with you. Uh, one just excerpt of this, and then you can give your two cents. Um, mm -hmm. What was said today, if economic developments evolve broadly in line with the MPR outlook, monetary policy resort, report, not resort, you were just at a resort, uh, governing council uh, expects to hold the policy rate as it's at it. Oh, I'm losing it today. Are you okay? At its current level, while it assesses the impact of the cumulative interest rate increases, Governing Council is prepared to increase the policy rate further if needed to return inflation to 2% target and remains resolute in its commitment to restoring price stability to Canadians. So at this point, it looks like there could be a pause right now. Mm -hmm. They are going to assess as they go. Next rate meeting is March 8th. Mm -hmm. 11 days, 11 days, I didn't get much sleep last night, uh, before my birthday. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we'll see what happens. If they bump it again, another little 0.25, or if they hold for a longer period. But this is the, I think, eighth consecutive increase they've done. So could they be holding next? Nobody knows. 
Yeah, I mean, eighth consecutive increase, but I think you need to read between the lines here. Uh, it's just a 0.25, and I know a 0.25 is still not fun still an for increase. anyone. Still an increase, but it's significantly less than what it has been. I mean, we were seeing a lot of 0.5s, 0.75s, even the full percentage point um, before. The language that's being spoken of, of course, they've got, the, got to give themselves that little out of like, we're willing to raise if we need to. Um, but September last year, they were saying, okay, it's gone up 0.75 and it's definitely still going up. So uh, very, very different language than now, which is, you know, if things work out the way we're expecting, we're gonna basically hold. And that reflects in the market, as we've said constantly, we've seen that already in January. Activity has, I don't wanna say peaked. peaked it's definitely picked up. And a lot of that is because people feel more comfortable. And that's why we get onto one of the first reasons why I think real estate is a good option now. Because to your point, you actually said this the other day, and I'm gonna be caught on camera saying this, but I'll give you credit. Real estate is not too expensive right now. It's money is too expensive right now. People were spending money on real estate when it was more expensive itself, the asset. It's just the fact that money's more expensive. So when that outlook starts to look a little bit more rosy and people start looking long-term, there's people I've seen get in the market now for the short-term fixed, knowing that they can go back to more of a preferred variable or something like that in a short period of time. It's a good option as things inevitably, and I hate when people do this, but it, I mean, it's human behavior, so I get it. When it's going up, it's always going up. When it's going down, it's always going down. And it, it, people forget what a balanced market is. They just think that we're either in sellers markets and prices are going sky high, or we're in buyers markets and prices completely drop. And prices don't completely drop at the end of the day. I mean, what I think you've even got the figures there on how much it's, it's dropped from the peak. Yeah, so uh, on that, th there's always the people that are wishful thinking out loud, stating it as a forecast. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've gone into it, we're gonna go into it a bit differently um, with, you've got those housing start details. Mm -hmm. um, we'll touch on the immigration stuff. But I think we're looking at what we've seen, the interest rates have gone up about five-fold almost um, since more since the the bottom and we've come down give or take um, under 20 percent mm -hmm. in pricing that whole greater vancouver spread i is, think it's about 17 percent from peak on average yeah yeah so we're seeing a lot more resilience in the pricing than anyone anticipated when these rates started going up um then I, I think at this point, as we're especially seeing uh, more positive uh, points of view from the Bank of Canada, that things are going to assumably sustain and then start dropping, that's just more insight to sellers that don't have to sell uh, to hold on for longer. So we haven't seen this big wave of, uh, of uh, foreclosures and all this sort of stuff that a lot of people were hoping for and forecasting for. Um, but I want to touch on your, your point to what I, what I was talking about last week. The money is more expensive, not the real estate. So I realized, Al, you'll know this, when, when I was cutting that video, I realized I did the math wrong. Oh. Of course you did. Half the math, I fixed. Why am I not surprised? The other half, I did not. So that video of that, those numbers on TikTok got 21,000, almost 22,000 views in wow. three days, which is the, the most I've seen. But then I realized the goddamn math is wrong. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Fundamentally, it was correct, but the specifics were wrong. But to your point, peak market at drop bottom rates. Isn't that the left? Oh my God, you're left. Isn't that the left of the world? <laughs> no. Peak market uh, at bottom rates, you were looking at, the example was, uh, works out to 4,800. Uh, sorry, 3,800 a month and 20% off the purchase price today, as we've just kind of rounded up and said at peak high rates, um, you're looking at 4,800. So it's a thousand bucks more for the same property that's 20% less today. Yeah. So again, as we start seeing this plateau um, and there's more confidence in the market, which I believe will relate to sellers holding firm, mm -hmm. um, we can jump into either your thing or this immigration stuff next, why I think 
even though domestic buyers are saying this is what we've been waiting for, it's still gonna continue to crash. Personally, I don't think they're going to get that wish today. No, and I mean, we've already had this discussion multiple times through throughout the years of where we think is, is best to put your money and based on what's going on. And sometimes we've even come out and said, look, at the moment we'd put money into real estate, we'd put money into real estate over the stock market, stock market over real estate. But right now, if you're looking at where else to put your money from an investment standpoint, is you're looking at the stock market, it's a little bit shaky right now. People are waiting. If you look at, say, precious metals like gold, for example, yes, it went on a bit of a rally, but people can't really tell where it's coming from because if you look at how many people are buying the asset versus institutional investors and so on, everyone's kind of sitting on the fence waiting. So where is that going right now? Crypto obviously has taken a, a huge hit um, from its peak, the whole thing with FTX. So there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And then we come to real estate, which is a popular one. And again, the premise of this is long term. Like we're always looking at long term when we're talking, whatever it is, whether it's investments in real estate, stock market, anything, we're always talking long term. We're not a fan of the, you know, just buy it and then sell it next year, hoping you're going to get a profit. That's how you should look at your investments. And we've said it before with the immigration factor coming in along with where we're at in the number of homes now we just don't have the homes in order to compete so scotia bank released um a report of i think it was in may 2021 at that point and they said that since 2016 our our population to housing supply ratio has basically been dipping so we're the worst in the g7 by quite a way um between 2016 to 2021, we needed an additional 100,000 homes to what were built in order to keep that ratio somewhat stable. And that would have us still way beyond um, what our G7 counterparts are doing. So obviously we know this, we've been spoke, speaking about this for a long time. They're trying to ramp up immigration. Um, oh, they are. Um, so, I mean, the goal is what, half a million immigrants? Canada has an average of 2.4 per household. So that means we need to build an extra 210,000 new units a year. Now, I think we achieved that last year and the year before, but don't forget we're playing catch up and pre-construction is taking a bit of a nose dive. So an extra 210,000 units on top of what they're already doing. Yep, or per year not on top of what they're already doing. We're, I'm looking at the future now. So for 2023. That's what we need per year, yeah. And that's, again, that's just to manage the incoming immigration. That's before we even get into the conversation of, well, we're already drastically behind, so we're playing catch up. Pre-construction is going down, or new construction is, is going down significantly because of where interest rates are at, construction loans, barriers to entry and whatnot. Um, that's before a whole lot of these other things, which is just making, unfortunately, the situation even worse. Yeah, so just so you know as well, what, that, what, what actually translates behind the scenes on that is construction loans are typically floating rate loans, like your line of credit, for example. So as your interest rate on your mortgage has gone up, so is the interest rate on a lot of these construction loans. A lot of these guys, especially the little guys, the mom and pops, they're not building with cash. They're borrowing money and there's overhead and all this crazy stuff. That's why there's a lot of hesitancy to enter a market like this because the money is a lot more expensive than they need and what can they sell for? Where's the market gonna be in a year after they deal with City Hall and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it works in segments. So unlike a regular mortgage, you don't just get all of the money given up front in one. You typically have to get to certain points in order to get the next portion of money. So then when it comes to supply chain issues like we're seeing really bad now across Canada and a variety of things, not just real estate, it delays everything and to Jay's point, your character carrying those costs, that overhead. And you know, what could have been a six to 12 month project can be an 18 to 24 month project. And especially for these smaller mom and pop shops, that's the difference between, you know, making money and losing a lot of money. So pushing that to the side. And I mean, if we look at, I think you've got some figures here and we'll go over here, but if you just look at the basic way real estate has performed in Canada since like the year 2000, it is disgusting disgustingly good. So you have those numbers, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, I've got those numbers for you, Jay. Oh, 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 have I got those numbers for you? So a lot of these naysayers and all of this, it's just in the long term, it just doesn't match up. 
It just Wishful does thinking. not match up. If I mean, you're arguing, essentially you're arguing a few percentage points, if that, in the grand scheme of like 150, 200% type realm numbers. So, and that's only gonna get worse based on the immigration and how low in supply that we are and so on and so forth. Segwaying into my next segment on the page here, based on immigration. Now, as we've discussed and been called racist countless times in the last year for discussing. Here we go again. The uptick in immigration was forecasted at 400,000 last year and then it came to 500,000, blah, blah, blah. That's for all of Canada, of course. So let's whittle it down to what actually matters to us because I don't care what happens back east because we don't deal with that. So here, in BC, July 2021 to July 2022, we had 83,200 immigrants land here, which averages 20,800 a quarter. Mm -hmm. Then quickly after that, Q3 2022, so the last quarter of last year, we received 53,603 new Canadians international immigrants. This is not cross-border movement or anything like this. This is new, straight to our province. So that quarter was the first quarter we've ever seen over 50,000 new immigrants to the province, to a province, I believe, specifically this one, but I believe that's Canada-wide, a province. And um, that's a 78.1% increase over the last year, quarter numbers, um, over the same quarter last year. So. The question is, how sustainable at current levels is this? The people you're talking about that are calling for another 10, 20, 30% off, blah, 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 these wishful thinking forecasts, um, possibly- Based on nothing, by well, the way. Their wishful thinking is, yeah, they're, they're fairy dust in the air, would possibly have relevance if we were a remotely static group in this province or country. Um, the fact that all these people are coming in, these people have different motivations than the people on the ground here that have watched the market, uh, whined over the market with good reason. If you can't afford it, it's very frustrating, I get it, but, and want all this, all this, uh, all these prices to come down so they can get in. These new people wanna come in and have, have a home, if ownership is a key thing in this new land for them, which of course it is, uh, they're gonna buy. They don't care about the politics and the bureaucracy we've seen up until this point. It's a matter of, okay, I've landed, I'm here, papers, money, let's buy. I wanna raise my family here now, let's go. So you're fighting against this wave that the federal government is pushing into the country. It's got its right and its opinion of why all these people should be here and economy growth and I get all that, but on the ground, how sustainable is this in the sense of you, the Canadian that's grown up here, getting in and not, or waiting until it goes cheaper against this wave of people that are coming in just saying, let me in, fully in, I'm buying, let's go. It's we, not sustainable. No, I mean, which segues into nicely what I have here when you look at real estate in the long term across Canada. So Q1 2000, to Q1 2009, house prices rose by 79%. That's 49% when you adjust for inflation. That's two years, seven to nine? 79%. No, no, no sorry, what was the timeline? Two, 2000 to 2009. Okay, nine years, yeah. 79%. <clears throat> 2009 to 2012 increased by another 24%, even though government were trying to cool the market at that point. 2012 to 2015, tied to mortgage rules, and it still rose 15.7%. 2016 to 2020, rose by almost 40%, and then 2021, they've soared by 21%. So, in the long scheme of things, it's going up, significantly going up, based on the immigration and what we were just talking about, it's not gonna calm down soon. The government have tried to call it, and we can already see they still went up double digits. Even if you were debating like in the early 2000s, whether you should buy a home, and you maybe opted against it, let's say all of the 2021 pandemic kind of induced prices, they dropped off and you were down 21%. We think they're at like 17% now. You still should have bought back then because home prices are a good like 115, 120% higher than the early 2000s. 
even with all of this stuff going on. So again, it just proves that it's real, it's long-term real estate as well. We're not just trying to flip anything here. And it just, it, it's just, it's the safe bet. I, I think it just shows that if it's a very good, although at times it can be volatile, like anything else you put your money into, um, it's been a very surefire thing. And as they do, I mean, you could argue as well, well, the amount of money printing that's gone into the system is why prices are going up. Same with the stock market, that's a part of it. But as you get all these new Canadians into the country, buying this whole Canadian dream, which is part of it, a big part of it is buying their home, mm -hmm. it's just going to keep going. So again, if things were static on the population front, it'd be a totally different world, but it's not, yeah. and we're not seeing that anytime soon. So those numbers are, I mean, there's been massive immigration the whole way along, not to the levels we've seen now, but obviously we've been bringing people in for those 20 years we're going yeah. back. And now we're bringing more people in. So why, why is it gonna go telling the other way here? Because money is only essentially going to get cheaper because what's happened with these interest rates is a one-off. I mean, we've never had this many rate hikes in such a short amount of time. And, you know, the likelihood of it actually happening again, I mean, you're betting on a pandemic of sorts happening again. Even if it did happen again, how much has been learned from this one? Would the same thing occur? Probably not. So one could assumably say you're a bit more sheltered and we shouldn't see this reaction happen again. It's kind of like a one-off, if you will. Well, anytime anyone is gonna quote high interest rates again, it's gonna be the 80s. Yeah. The time it got so unbearable, it was 21%, 22%, 23%. Now, mind you, the prices in the 80s were different. Honestly different. Um, and I'm not comparing it to now, all I'm saying is the last time the rates shot up uncontrollably it's felt was back then mm -hmm. um, and now. So there's a 40 year gap. And I mean, the other thing is, is I get real estate is expensive. Like it sucks. It would love to, especially with social media these days. And there's all these pictures of like these videos of like, this is what 400,000 gets you in Texas. And it's like a beautiful home. I get real estate is expensive and it sucks. But because of that, don't let people who can't afford it or who are bitter about that guide you down a route just from pure bitterness as opposed to sound financial advice, sound investing advice. Because unfortunately, that's what I see a lot of. I see a lot of people who are just angry that they can't get into the market. And so they feel that, you know, I've got to commit to this resolute outcome. Um, Otherwise, like it's, it's insulting or like, otherwise I can't take it. And I've just got to hold on to the naysayers. You ask anyone who debated, you know, should I have bought in 2010, 2012? And you ask them now if they're happy they bought? Yes. I think what it comes down to is if, if you feel it's in your cards and you want to own real estate, we know there's plenty of other places to put money, but if you want to own real estate, I think it always comes back to as soon as you can afford it, it makes sense to buy it. Yep. You could argue today that it's expensive. Yes, it was expensive 12 months ago. Is it the property now? Is it the money now? These are just wheels turning in, again, the long term. And as soon as you can afford to buy it, just buy it and don't pay attention to the rates. A lot of the comments on that stupid post were like, oh, I shouldn't have bought last year. The rates have gone up. In 10 years time, you're exactly. So as account. long as you caveat can continue to pay and didn't overstretch yourself and don't lose your job. And I know not all these things are within your control, but you've got to be smart about the decision. Fundamentally speaking, as soon as you can do it, do it. And then don't watch the news. <laughs> don't watch social media. So you, you're just losing hairline month over month because it's all just talk and if your rate is locked in and you're in then you're in you i mean stay. the thing is to your point real estate is always expensive when those people bought in 2000 they would have said it was expensive yeah, but then in 2009 when the price went up 79 percent, people would have loved to have paid 2000 prices for real estate it's As the way it works pay 2009 prices today so that's it so you'll buy you buy today and then in 10 years time people are going to be like oh i wish i'd which I'd bought then and paid 2023 prices. So it's just cyclical. Time in the market, not time. <sighs> it is, it is. I think that pretty much wraps us up. Um, bit of an announcement to make. Um, I've basically been so successful on mankles on OnlyFans. 
um, with my images. Through no help from Jay, I no longer need to dabble with Sharp Real Estate Group. The only images on my ankles are my ankles, just for the record. Yeah. You've taken advantage of me again. It's sue me. Nonetheless, this is going to be my last video with Sharp Real Estate. I appreciate you guys. I am parting ways. I'll be doing my own thing. Um, but I've appreciated you guys over the years. Uh, if you have any questions on what we've just spoken about, drop us a comment. Um, you can still email us. Yes, follow those dainty hands. Let's um, drop in comments below. Always appreciate it. I'll, I'll miss those. Yes. But thank you as always, guys. And Jay, we'll see you next week. Thank you, sir. Until next time. Bye forever. Boom. Mm -hmm.